I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures, scheduled for this week, will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewontin. Last night, Professor Lewontin discussed the role biology has played in legitimizing a society of inequality. Over the past century, numerous studies have claimed to prove that differences in performance between the races, classes and genders are in fact natural and therefore unalterable, that they are coded in our genes and passed on from one generation to the next. At various times, studies have proved, for example, that blacks had lower intelligence than whites, that women were less suited to positions of power than men, or that the lower classes took their place at the bottom of the ladder because of their innate inferiority. In his lecture, Dr. Lewinton pointed out that there is no scientific evidence to support any of these claims. And what's more, it would be almost impossible to produce such evidence, because first, the interplay between genes and environment in human society is too complex to isolate the effects of one or the other. And second, even if there were a strong genetic component to a particular behaviour, this does not mean that the behaviour can't be changed or affected by the environment. But while such studies have been widely refuted, the interest in genes has increased over the years. The discovery of the structure of DNA, the stuff genes are made of, in the 1950s, and advances in microtechnology in the 70s and 80s, have given scientists newfound abilities to locate and manipulate genes. With this has come a renewed faith in genes as the cause for virtually every human trait, be it physical, mental, or social. So while in the past scientists thought genetic disorders were relatively rare, today they're claiming that almost everything that ails humans, from high blood pressure to cancer to manic depression, is a genetic disease. Professor Lewontin is well placed to critique these claims. As an evolutionary biologist, his work has been to study the nature of genetic variation in populations and to try to understand the relationship of genes and environment. His theoretical and experimental contributions to this field have won him numerous honours. In addition to his scholarly publications, he has written two important books in the field aimed at a lay audience. Education, IQ and Class, co-authored with Michelle Schiff, and Not in Our Genes, co-authored with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamin. Tonight, Professor Lewinton turns his attention to the problems of health and disease, and he also shows how economic relations can affect the entire direction of biological research and technology. And now, Biology as Ideology, Part 3. We all think we know what we mean by cause and effect. If I slip on the ice on my way to class in winter and I break my leg, I will say that the cause of my broken leg was my fall. But one of my students will say that the real cause of my broken leg was my hurrying to class at 8 in the morning when a more reasonable teacher would have set the class for 10. A lawyer friend who hears about my fall will tell me that the cause of my fracture was the negligence of the city of Cambridge which failed to sand the streets when they were icy. And my more political friends will say that the cause of my broken leg was the unequal tax structure in Massachusetts, which starves cities of the money they need to provide basic services. One of the major prejudices of modern science, and especially of biology, is concerned with the nature of causes. Generally, one looks for the cause of an effect. Or, even if there are a number of causes allowed, one supposes that there is a major cause, and the others are only subsidiary. In any case, these causes are separated from each other, studied independently, and manipulated and interfered with in an independent way. These causes are usually seen to be at an individual level, the individual gene, or the defective organ, or an individual human being. This view of causes is nowhere more evident than in our theories of health and disease. Any textbook of medicine will tell us that the cause of tuberculosis is the tubercle bacillus, which gives us the disease when it infects us. Modern scientific medicine tells us that the reason we no longer die of infectious diseases 
is because of scientific medicine with its antibiotics, chemical agents, and high-tech methods of caring for the sick has defeated the insidious bacteria. What's the cause of cancer? The cause is the unrestricted growth of cells, and that growth in turn is a consequence of the failure of certain genes to regulate cell division. So, we get cancer because our genes are not doing their business. It used to be that people thought viruses were a major cause of cancer, and a great deal of money and time have been spent looking for the viral causes of cancer in humans, but without any success. Anyway, biology's moved on from the time when viruses were all the rage to a time when genes are much more trendy. On the other hand, there are the environmental insult theories of the causes of cancer. Cancers are caused, we are told, by asbestos, or by PVC, or by a host of natural chemicals over which we have no control. And although they are present in very low concentrations, we are exposed to them over and over again during our lives. So just as we will avoid dying from tuberculosis by dealing with the bug that causes it, so we will avoid dying from cancer by getting rid of particularly nasty chemicals in the environment. It's certainly true that one cannot get tuberculosis without a tubercle bacillus. And the evidence is quite compelling that one cannot get a cancer called mesothelioma without having ingested asbestos or some related compound. But is that the same thing as saying that the cause of tuberculosis is the tubercle bacillus and the cause of mesothelioma is asbestos? What are the consequences for our health of thinking in this way? Suppose I said that tuberculosis was a disease extremely common in the sweatshops and miserable factories of the 19th century, whereas tuberculosis rates were much lower among country people and in the upper classes. Then I might be justified in saying that the cause of tuberculosis was unregulated industrial capitalism, and if we did away with that system of social organization, we wouldn't have to worry about the tubercle bacillus. When we look at the history of health and disease in modern European society, that explanation makes at least as good a sense as blaming the poor bacterium. What is the evidence for the successes of modern scientific medicine? Of course, we do live a lot longer than our ancestors. In 1890, the average years of life expected for a child at birth was only 45, whereas now the expected lifespan is 75 years. But that is not because modern medicine has prolonged the life of elderly and sick people. A very large fraction of the change in the average life expectancy is a tremendous reduction in the infant mortality rate. Before the turn of the century, and especially earlier in the 19th century, there was a considerable chance that a child never got to be a year old. The infant mortality rate, for example, was 13% in 1860. So the average life expectancy for the population as a whole was reduced considerably by all this early death. If you go back into an old cemetery and look at the ages of people who died in the middle of the 19th century, you'll find a remarkable number of very old people. In fact, scientific medicine has done very little to add years of life for people who have already reached their maturity. In the last 50 years, only about four months have been added to the expected lifespan of a person who's already got to be 60 years old, either in the United States or Canada. As we all know, in modern European society, women live longer than men, but they didn't used to. Before the turn of the century, women died sooner than men did. And a common explanation that's offered by scientific medicine is that an important cause of death in women in the bad old days was childbirth fever. According to this view, modern antiseptic medicine and hospital practice has been a major lifesaver for younger women during their childbearing years. But if you actually look at the statistics, Childbirth fever was a minor cause of death of women during the 19th century, even women of childbearing age, and it was certainly not the cause of the excess mortality of women. Nearly all that excess mortality was a consequence of tuberculosis, probably because women had a much poorer diet than men. When tuberculosis ceased to be a major killer, women ceased to live a shorter lifespan than men did. What about the history of tuberculosis, then, and all those other infectious diseases that were so terrible in the 19th century and the early part of this one? If we look at the causes of death, first systematically recorded in 1830 in Britain and a bit later in North America, 
what we find is that most people did indeed die of infectious disease, and in particular of respiratory diseases. They died of tuberculosis. They died of diphtheria, of bronchitis, of pneumonia, and particularly among children, they died of measles and the perennial killer smallpox. As the 19th century progressed, the death rate from all of these causes decreased in a rather regular fashion. Smallpox, of course, was dealt with by a medical advance, but one that could hardly be claimed by modern scientific medicine, since smallpox vaccination was discovered in the 18th century and was already quite widespread by the early part of the 19th. The death rates from the major killers, like bronchitis, pneumonia, and tuberculosis, fell rather regularly during the 19th century with no obvious cause. There was no observable effect on the death rate after the germ theory of disease was announced in 1876 by Robert Koch. The death rate from these infectious diseases simply continued to go down as if Koch had never lived. By the time chemical therapy was introduced for tuberculosis in the earlier part of this century, more than 90% of the decrease of the death rate from that disease had already occurred. One of the most revealing cases is measles. Nowadays, Canadian and American children don't often get measles because they're vaccinated against it. But when I was a child, every school child had measles, yet no one that I know ever died of it. In the 19th century, measles was the major killer of young children, and in many African countries today, it remains the major source of mortality for children. Measles is a disease that everyone got, for which there was no known cure or medical treatment, and which simply stopped killing children in the developed countries, although they have continued to get sick. These progressive ameliorations of health were not a consequence, for example, of modern sanitation, because the diseases that were major killers in the 19th century were respiratory diseases and not waterborne diseases. It's unclear that simple crowding had much to do with the question, since some parts of our cities are quite as crowded as they were in the middle of the 19th century. As far as we can tell, the major decrease in death rates from the major infectious killers of the 19th century is a consequence of the general improvement in nutrition and is related simply to an increase in the real wage. In countries like Brazil today, infant mortality rises and falls with decreases and increases in the minimum wage. The immense betterment of nutrition also explains the drop in the higher rate of tuberculosis among women than among men. In the 19th century, and indeed even long into the 20th century in Britain, working men were far better nourished than their women at home. Often if meat could be afforded for the table in an urban working class family in Britain, it was saved for the man. So, there have been complex social changes resulting in increases in the real earnings of the great mass of people. This has been reflected in part in their far better nutrition. And it's these changes that really lie at the basis of our increased longevity and our decreased death rate from infectious disease. Although one may say that the tubercle bacillus causes tuberculosis, we're much closer to the truth when we say that it was the conditions of unregulated 19th century competitive capitalism, unmodulated by the demands of labor unions and of the state, that was the cause of tuberculosis. But social causes are not in the ambit of biological science. So medical students continue to be taught that the cause of tuberculosis is the bacillus. In the last 20 years, precisely because of the decline in infectious disease as an important source of ill health, other single causes have been raised as the culprits in disease. It's undoubtedly true that pollutants and industrial wastes are the immediate physiological causes of cancer, of miners' black lung, of textile workers' brown lung, and a whole host of other disorders. Moreover, it's undoubtedly true that there are trace amounts of cancer-causing substances, even in the best of our food and water, unpolluted by pesticides and herbicides that make farm workers so sick. But to say that pesticides cause the death of farm workers, or that cotton fibers cause brown lung and textile workers, is to make a fetish out of inanimate objects. We must distinguish between agents and causes. Asbestos fibers and pesticides are the agents of disease and disability. But it is illusory to suppose that if we eliminate these particular irritants, that the diseases will go away, for other similar irritants will take their place. 
So long as efficiency, or the maximization of profit from production, or the filling of centrally planned norms of production, without any reference to the means, remain the motivating force of productive enterprise the world over, one pollutant will replace another. So long as people are trapped by economic need or state regulation into production and consumption of certain kinds of things, then one poison will follow another in the productive process. Regulatory agencies or central planning departments will calculate cost-benefit ratios where human misery is somehow assigned a dollar cost. Often this is done by the number of days of work lost or the cost of medical care. But of course, none of these methods can really put a dollar cost on human misery. Asbestos and cotton lint fibers are not the causes of cancer. They are the agents of social causes, of social formations that determine the nature of our productive and consumptive lives. And in the end, it is only through changes in those social forces that we can get to the root of problems of health. The transfer of causal power from social relations into inanimate agents, which then seem to have a power and life of their own, is one of the major mystifications of science and its ideologies. Just as pollution is the most modern and up-to-date version of the external hostile forces of the physical world, so simple internal forces, the genes, are now held responsible not only for human health in its normal medical sense, but for a variety of social problems like alcoholism, criminality, drug addiction, and mental disorders. Just last month, in the pages of the New York Times, the famous Nobel Prize winner in molecular biology, James Watson, argued that we must spend vast sums of money to sequence the entire human genome. To support this claim, he said, we must now make a deliberate effort to surmount the next technological hurdles that keep scientists from understanding the molecular essence of other tragic and devastating illnesses like alcoholism and manic depression. Somehow, we are assured that if we could only find those genes that underlie alcoholism or the genes that have gone awry when we get cancer or become depressed, that our problems will be over. The current manifestation of this belief is the Human Genome Sequencing Project that Watson is arguing for. It's a multi-billion dollar program of North American and European biologists that is meant to take the place of space programs as the current great consumer of public monies in the interest of conquering nature. The purpose of this program is to give the complete molecular order of all the genes in the human genome. We already know a great deal about what genes are made of and how they work at the most basic level. A gene is a long string of small molecules called nucleotides. There are only four kinds of these nucleotides whose names are abbreviated by the letters A, T, C, and G. Every gene is a long string, sometimes thousands or even tens of thousands, of these A's, T's, C's, and G's in a particular order. A, A, T, C, C, G, G, C, A, T, T, and so on. This long sequence serves two functions. First, it specifies, like a code, exactly what the constitution of the protein molecules that make up our body will be. Corresponding to a particular sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's, they'll be produced by the machinery of the body, a long molecule called a protein, made up of simple elements called amino acids. If one or more nucleotides in the gene are changed, a different amino acid may be put into the protein, and the protein may not be able to carry on its physiological function as well as before. In some cases, when a different nucleotide is substituted in a gene, less or even no protein may be manufactured, because the protein manufacturing machinery of the body has a hard time recognizing the code. An example is a disease called thalassemia, which is very common in India and Pakistan and also in the Mediterranean, and from which I presume a fair number of immigrants to Canada from those regions may suffer. It's a genetic disorder that causes anemia because rather less hemoglobin is produced than normally. And the reason less hemoglobin is produced is that a change in the nucleotide sequence of the gene has made it much more difficult for the translation machinery of the body to decode the code and to make the protein. Other parts of the gene 
also sequences of nucleotides, form part of the machinery that turns off and turns on the production of proteins. In this way, although the same genes are in every part of the body during every part of the life of an organism, uh, proteins corresponding to some genes will be produced at some times and in some parts of the body, whereas they will not be produced at other times and in other parts of the body. This turning on and turning off of the creation of the body's constituents is itself sensitive to external conditions. For example, if a certain kind of sugar is given to a bacterium, this sugar will signal the bacterial machinery to start making a protein that will break down the sugar and use it as a source of energy. This signal is in fact detected by part of the gene itself. So in this way, nucleotide sequences determine what kind of proteins organisms will make, but they also are part of the signaling machinery that turns on and turns off the manufacture of those proteins in response to external conditions. This is the way in which the environment interacts with the genes in creating organisms. Genes have yet a further function, which is to serve as a pattern for the manufacture of further copies of themselves. When cells divide and sperm and egg cells are produced, every new cell has a complete set of genes more or less identical with the genes in the old cells. These newly manufactured genes are copied directly from the gene molecules that previously existed. Since no chemical copying process is perfect, mistakes are made. These are the so-called mutations. Uh, but these happen about one in a million copies as a rule. This machinery, as I have described it, is what we know about genes at present. And it both makes possible and has given rise to the demand for a knowledge of the complete sequence of all human genes. That is what the Human Genome Sequencing Project is all about. The Human Genome Sequencing Project is an ambitious plan to write down the complete nucleotide sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's for all the genes of the human being. With current technology, this is an immensely ambitious project that might take 30 years and occupy tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars. It will involve large numbers of person hours of laboratory work, huge amounts of chemicals, the invention and design of new machinery, the writing of new computer programs, and perhaps even the creation of special computers to make all the data fit together. Of course, there's always the promise that new or more efficient technology will become available to reduce the magnitude of the job. But why would one like to know the complete sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up all the human genes? The claim is that if one had a reference sequence from a so-called normal individual, and one compared bits and pieces of the sequence from a person with some disorder, then the differences between the normal sequence and the sequence from the unhealthy person would tell us just where the genetic defect is that causes the disease. We could then translate the genetic code of the altered person into an altered protein to see what's wrong with the protein, and this might tell us how to treat the disease. For example, we might actually correct the molecular defect of the gene itself and implant it back into the diseased person. This is what's called gene therapy. Earlier this fall, this was in fact done for the first time with a baby that suffered from a disease that prevented it from having a normal immune system. So if diseases are caused by defective genes, and if we know what a normal gene looks like in its finest molecular detail, we would then know what to do about fixing the abnormal physiology. We would know what proteins have gone awry in cancer, and could somehow or another invent ways to fix them up. Supporters of this view would also claim that we might find particular altered proteins or missing proteins in schizophrenics or in manic depressives or in alcoholics or in drug-dependent people. And by an appropriate manipulation, we might relieve them of these terrible disabilities. Moreover, by comparing all the human genes in their molecular detail with the genes of, say, a chimpanzee or a gorilla, we would know why we're different from chimpanzees. That is, we would know what it is to be human. So what's wrong with this vision? Well, the first error it makes is in talking about the human gene sequence as if all human beings were alike. In fact, there's an immense amount of variation from normal individual to normal individual in the amino acid sequence of their proteins because a given protein may have a variety of amino acid compositions without in the least impairing its function. Each of us carries two genes for every protein, 
one that we got from our mother, and one we got from our father. On the average, the amino acid sequence specified by our maternally inherited and paternally inherited genes differ in about one out of every 12 genes. In addition, because of the nature of the genetic code, many changes can occur at the level of DNA which are not reflected at all in the proteins themselves. That is, there are many different DNA sequences that correspond to the same protein sequence. We do not have very good estimates for humans at the moment, but if humans are anything like experimental animals, about one in every 500 nucleotides will differ in DNA taken from any two individuals chosen at random in this audience. Since there are roughly three billion nucleotides in human genes, then any two human beings in this audience will differ on the average in about 600,000 different nucleotides. And an average gene, which is say about 3,000 nucleotides long, will differ between any two normal individuals by about 20 different nucleotides. Whose genome then is going to provide the sequence for the catalog for the normal person? Certainly not mine. Moreover, every normal person carries a very large number of defective genes in single dose inherited from one parent but not from the other. And these are covered up by a normal copy that they receive from their other normal parent. So any piece of DNA that's sequenced will have a certain number of unknown defective genes entered into the catalog. When the DNA from a person with a disease is compared to the DNA from the standard normal catalog sequence, it would be impossible to decide which of the multiple differences between the two DNAs is responsible for the disease if indeed any are. It would be necessary to look at a very large population of normal and diseased people to see if one could find some common difference between them. But even this may not happen if the disease in question has a multiple genetic cause so that different people have the same disease for different reasons, even if all those reasons are a consequence of genetic changes. We already know this to be the case for the human disease about which I spoke before, thalassemia. Thalassemia, remember, is a blood disorder in which less than the normal amount of hemoglobin is made. It turns out that among Asians and Europeans, there are at least 17 different defects in different parts of the hemoglobin gene, all of which have the effect of reducing the amount of hemoglobin produced. We'd look in vain for a particular nucleotide that differed between thalassemic and normal people. In the case of thalassemia, Extensive population studies have revealed the correct story. But the possession of a standard normal sequence of the entire human genome was of no help and would have been no help here or in any other case. But there's another problem. The description I gave earlier of genes as determining particular proteins that an organism can manufacture, as being part of the signaling system that responds to the environment in turning on and turning off the manufacture of proteins, as being the model for the manufacture of more of themselves, differs in a subtle way from the usual description of these relations. It's usually said that genes make proteins and that genes are self-replicating. But in fact, genes can make nothing. A protein is made by a complex system of chemical production involving other proteins, using the particular sequence of nucleotides in a gene to determine the exact formula for the protein being manufactured. Sometimes the gene is said to be the blueprint for a protein or the source of information for determining a protein. As such, it's seen as more important than the mere manufacturing machinery. Yet, of course, proteins cannot be manufactured without both the gene and the rest of the machinery. Neither is more important. Isolating the gene as the so-called master molecule is another unconscious ideological commitment one that places brains above brawn, mental work is superior to mere physical work, information is higher than action. Nor are genes self-replicating. They cannot make more of themselves any more than they can make a protein. Genes are made by a complex machinery of proteins, which uses the genes as a model for more genes. By referring to genes as self-replicating, they're endowed with a mysterious autonomous power that seems to place them above the more ordinary materials of the body. Yet if anything in the world can be said to be self-replicating, it's not the gene, but the entire organism as a complex system. The third problem of the Human Genome Sequencing Project 
is that it once again claims that if one knows the molecular configuration of our genes, one knows everything that's worth knowing about us. It regards the gene as determining the individual and the individual as determining society. It isolates an alteration in a so-called cancer gene as the cause of cancer, whereas that alteration in the gene may in turn have been caused by ingesting a pollutant, which in turn was produced by an industrial process, which in turn was the inevitable consequence of investing money at 6%. Once again, the impoverished notion of causation, confusing causes and agents that characterizes modern biological ideology, drives us in particular directions to find solutions for our problems. Why then do so many very powerful, famous, successful, and extremely intelligent scientists want to sequence the human genome? Obviously, the answer is in part that they're so completely devoted to the ideology of simple unitary causes that they believe in the efficacy of the research and don't ask themselves more complicated questions. But in part, the answer is a rather crass one. The participation in and the control of a multi-billion dollar, 30 or 50 year research project that will involve the everyday work of thousands of technicians and lower level scientists is an extraordinarily appealing prospect for an ambitious biologist. Great careers will be made, Nobel prizes will be given, honorary degrees will be offered, important professorships and huge laboratory facilities will be put at the disposal of those who control this project and who succeed in producing thousands of computer disks of human genome sequence. Research scientists are involved in this struggle, not only in their role as academics. Among molecular biologists who are professors in universities, a rather large proportion are also principal scientists or principal stockholders in biotechnology companies. Technology is a major industry and a major source of hope for profit for venture capital. The Human Genome Sequencing Project, to the extent that it creates new technologies at public expense, will provide to biotechnology companies very powerful tools for carrying out their production of commodities for sale on the market. Moreover, the general direction of biotechnological research will be guided by the possibility of producing such commodities. If it can't make a buck off it, it won't be done. The success of the project will give greater faith in the power of biotechnology to produce useful products. Nor are biotechnologies the only producers of commodities that stand to gain immensely from the Human Genome Sequencing Project. The project will itself consume vast quantities of chemical and mechanical commodities. There are commercial machines that manufacture DNA from small amounts of sample material. There are machines that automatically sequence DNA. All of these machines require the input of a variety of chemical materials, all of which are sold at an immense profit by companies that manufacture the machines. The Human Genome Sequencing Project is big business. The billions of dollars that are to be spent on it will go in no insignificant fraction into the annual dividends of productive enterprises. The realization that there are fairly straightforward economic and status rewards awaiting those who take part in the project has given rise to a powerful opposition to the project from within biology itself, from others who are doing a different kind of science and see their own careers and their own research threatened by the diversion of money, energy, and public consciousness. Some far-sighted biologists, like the current president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, have cautioned against the terrible public disillusionment that will follow the completion of the Human Genome Sequencing Project. The public will discover that despite the inflated claims of molecular biologists, people are still dying of cancer, of heart disease, of stroke, that institutions are still filled with schizophrenics and manic depressives that the war against drugs has not been won. The fear among many scientists is that by promising too much, science will destroy its public image and people will become cynical, as, for example, they became cynical about the war on cancer, not to speak about the war on poverty. A project of this magnitude, with so much money and prestige involved, also leads to a kind of intellectual corruption that's ordinarily thought of as the opposite of science. Recently, I've been engaged as an expert witness in criminal trials in which defendants are connected to the crime by matching bits of their DNA to DNA found at the scene of the crime. The work's currently done partly by commercial companies who make a profit only if they have a consistent record of producing positive matches for prosecutors and partly by FBI and RCMP laboratories intent on getting convictions. The actual methods are rather crude and have a high error rate. 
Moreover, the assumptions about the genetic composition of North American populations that are made when the chance of a purely chance match are calculated are totally unrealistic. As presently carried out, so-called DNA fingerprinting puts innocent defendants in serious jeopardy. Yet prestigious professors from important universities have appeared as expert witnesses in support of the technique, giving testimony in very general terms without offering any facts, and making assertions about human populations that have long been known to be untrue. Their motivation for this intellectual hanky-panky is, by their own testimony, because the Human Genome Sequencing Project, and indeed the entire enterprise of molecular biology, is under attack by skeptics. And that by calling into question the forensic use of these methods, we call into question the entire scientific enterprise. We see in the Genome Sequencing Project an aspect of biological science that's not often spoken of, and is perhaps the most mystified of all. That's the way in which what are said to be fundamental discoveries about the nature of life mask simple commercial relations that provide a powerful impetus for the direction and subject of research. The best documented example that we have of a purely commercial interest driving what is said to be a fundamental discovery about nature is in agriculture. Everyone has heard of hybrid corn, and it's commonly said that the invention of hybrid corn has resulted in immense increases in the productivity of agriculture and the consequent feeding of hundreds of millions of hungry people at a low cost and with great efficiency. Whereas in the 1920s, an average acre sown to maize in the corn belt of North America might yield, say, 35 bushels an acre, at present, in a decent year, one can get 125 bushels an acre. This is widely regarded as one of the greatest triumphs of basic genetics as applied to human welfare. But the truth is more interesting. A hybrid corn is produced by crossing two true breeding varieties of corn and taking the seed from that cross and planting it. These true breeding varieties are created by a long process of self-pollination of the corn to make each variety completely uniform genetically. A seed company will spend a certain number of years self-pollinating lines of corn until it gets uniform lines. And it will then sell to the farmer the seed that comes from crossing two of these uniform lines. The inbred, homogeneous lines themselves give rather poor yields, whereas the hybrid is vastly superior in productivity. It's not the case, however, that a cross between any two inbred, homogeneous lines of corn will produce a hybrid with high yield. It's necessary to search among many, many such homogeneous inbred lines to find pairs that will do the trick. The hybrid cross between the inbred lines has another quality, in addition to high yield, that's not much spoken about a quality with a unique commercial value. If a farmer has a high yielding variety of some crop, one that is resistant to disease and produces high commercial output as compared to the cost of the inputs, his normal way of carrying on his business would be to save some of the seed of this high yielding variety and to plant it next year to again achieve high yields. Once the farmer acquired the seed of this wonderful variety, he would no longer have to pay again to reacquire it because plants, like other organisms, reproduce themselves. But this fact of self-reproduction presents a very serious problem to someone who wants to make money by developing new varieties of organisms. For how will he make a profit if the moment he sold the seed, its further production is in the hands of the person who bought it? He'll get to sell it only one time, and then it will be distributed everywhere for nothing. This is the problem of copy protection. It also exists for computer software programs. The developer of computer software will be unwilling to devote time, energy, and money to developing a new program if the first customers who buy it can copy it and pass it around to their friends for virtually nothing. Plant breeders and seed producers could never make much money because farmers having bought the seed or the animal variety would in future generations produce it themselves. Of course, seeds produced on the farm may contain a certain amount of weed seed and not be produced under the very best conditions for germination. So, in fact, farmers occasionally do go back to the seed producer for new stock. In France, for example, the average wheat farmer goes back about once every six years to replenish the supply of wheat seed. Hybrid corn is different because hybrid seed is the cross between two self-propagating homogeneous lines 
one cannot plant the seed of hybrid corn and get new hybrid corn. Hybrids are not true breeding. The seeds that are born on a hybrid corn plant are not themselves hybrids, but form a population of plants of varying degrees of hybridity, a mixture of homogeneous and heterogeneous varieties. A farmer who saved seed from his hybrid corn and planted it the next year would lose at least 30 bushels an acre in the next crop. It's necessary for the farmer to go back every year and to buy the seed again. So the hybrid seed corn producer has found a method of copy protection. Moreover, the producer of the hybrid seed can charge the farmer a price for the hybrid seed, which is equivalent to the amount the farmer would have lost, that is the market value of about 30 bushels an acre, had he not returned to the seed company for more hybrid seed. The invention of hybrid corn was, in fact, a deliberate use of the principles of genetics to create a copy-protected product. We have that on the best authority possible, the statement of the inventors of hybrid corn themselves, Dr. Scholl and Dr. East, who wrote that hybrids are something that might easily be taken up by the seedsman, no, not by the farmer. In fact, it's the first time in agricultural history that a seedsman is enabled to gain the full benefit from a desirable origination of his own or something that he has purchased. The man who originates a new plant, which may be of incalculable benefit to the whole country, gets nothing, not even fame, for his pains, and the plant can be propagated by anyone. The utilization of the first-generation hybrids enables the originator to keep the parental types and to give out only the crossed seeds, which are less valuable for continued propagation. The realization that the hybrid method could guarantee to the inventor immense profits has resulted in the introduction of the hybrid method into all of agriculture. Chickens, tomatoes, swine, indeed nearly every commercial plant or animal where it's possible to introduce the method has seen the growth of hybrids at the expense of older varietal forms. Major seed companies, like the Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, have invested millions of dollars in attempting to produce hybrid wheat, which would then capture an immense untapped market. So far, they've not succeeded because the cost of production of the hybrid seeds is excessive. The Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company itself is the consequence of the activities of a single important political and scientific figure in the U.S., Henry Agard Wallace. Wallace's father was appointed Secretary of Agriculture by the U.S. President Warren Harding in 1920. The elder Wallace sent Henry on a tour of agricultural experiment stations, and he came back and advised his father to appoint as head of plant breeding a man who was devoted to hybrids. In the meanwhile, son Henry was himself experimenting with hybrids, and in 1924 he sold his first hybrid seed corn at a profit of about $740 an acre. In 1926, he founded the Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, and when he, in 1932, was appointed Secretary of Agriculture by President Franklin Roosevelt, pressure for the introduction of hybrid corn in the U.S., and subsequently in Canada, became irresistible. But what are we to make of this story? If hybrids really are a superior method for agricultural production, then the fact that they're also commercially useful is a side issue. The question is whether other methods of plant breeding that would not have provided property rights protection would have done just as well. The answer to that question depends on some issues in basic genetics that were undecided in the early history of hybrid corn. And up until about 30 years ago, one might have argued that the basic biology of corn production is such that only hybrids would do the trick. However, we've known the truth of the matter for the last 30 years. The fundamental experiments have been done, and no plant breeder disagrees with them. The nature of the genes responsible for influencing yield in corn are such that there was an alternative, and that alternative still exists. The alternative is one of simple, direct selection of high-yielding plants in each generation and the propagation of seed from those selected plants. By the method of selection, plant breeders could, in fact, produce varieties of corn that yield just as much as modern hybrids. The problem is that no commercial plant breeder will undertake such investigation and development because there's no money in it. One of the most interesting features of this story is the role of the agricultural experiment stations, like the state agricultural experiment stations in the U.S. or the Canada Department of Agriculture. 
these institutions might be expected to develop alternative methods. Since they're not supposed to be concerned with profit, they're working at the public expense. Yet the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Canada Department of Agriculture are among the strongest proponents of the hybrid method. What's happened is that a purely commercial interest has so successfully clothed itself in the claims of pure science that those claims are now taught as scientific gospel. Successive generations of agricultural research workers, even those who work in public institutions, believe that hybrids are intrinsically superior, even though the experimental results that contradict this have been published in well-known journals for over 30 years. Modern agricultural biotechnology is a direct inheritance from this tradition of the commercialization of research. At the present time, molecular biologists working with DNA sequences are attempting to introduce various genes for disease resistance or climatic stress resistance into crops and domestic animals. There's a major effort to introduce nitrogen fixation into plants that ordinarily depend on nitrogen fertilizers. While every one of these changes can be seen as increasing the productivity of agriculture and reducing our dependence on chemical treatments, they're being designed in such a way as to guarantee monopoly profits to their developers. Biotechnology companies have successfully pushed for plant and animal patenting in the United States. They are pushing for it in Canada as well, although so far they haven't succeeded. Moreover, seed are developed which cannot be self-reproduced by the farmer, or which must be specially treated with a chemical coating in factories before they will successfully germinate and grow into adult plants. Every development must be of the kind that will keep farmers from liberating themselves from the suppliers of these commodities. Once again, what appears to us in the mystical guise of pure science and of objective knowledge about nature turns out underneath to be political, economic, and social ideology. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, continue tomorrow night on Ideas.